folks. Welcome to day three of the Natural Areas Conference. My name is Daryl Bowman. I'm the Vice President of the Natural Areas Association Board of Directors. Um, I'd like to say I'm appreciative and humbled by serving this role with this organization. Um, and I can tell you our board and staff are amazing, dedicated professionals that take great pride in providing you with a meaningful, effective association. Um, I manned a booth for the Natural Areas Association last year in Reno, where we were supposed to be for this conference now. Uh, that was a huge gathering of fish and wildlife professionals uh, last year, and, and it was a great place to have a conference. And I just really regret we can't all be there now, but I really appreciate everybody attending this conference in this format. Um, and hopefully you're getting as much out of it as I am. Um, I'm speaking to you today from my office uh, at the headquarters of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, my role here is Assistant Chief of Fisheries, and I provide administrative oversight over several fisheries management programs, including all of our programs focused on restoring habitat and connectivity uh, in our stream resources in Arkansas. This is really important because we have 90,000 miles plus of streams here in Arkansas. So given that, uh, I'm really excited and honored uh, about our subject matter today and to uh, introduce our keynote speaker. Ben Goldfarb is an award-winning environmental journalist who covers wildlife management and conservation biology. His work is, has been featured in Science, Mother Jones, The Guardian, High Country News, Vice, Audubon Magazine, Orion, Scientific American, and many other publications. He holds a Master of Environmental Management degree from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And notably, he is the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, which the Washington Post called a masterpiece of a treatise on the natural world. That's really impressive. Um, he's currently at work on his second book on the ecological history of roads. Can't wait to see that. While he is happiest with a scuba tank strapped on his back or a fly rod in his hand, which I can relate to, I'm delighted that he was able to spare time to be with us today. And uh, we really look forward to this. Please join me in welcoming Ben Goldfarb. Thank you so much, Daryl, for that generous introduction, and thanks to uh, to all of you um, out there for for joining me today. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm yeah really happy to be to be speaking with a, a group of such uh, influential public lands or or just lands managers uh, who can who can really sort of help carry the the, the beaver movement uh, uh, along. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, begin this talk by asking you to perform a little exercise, which is just do me a favor wherever, wherever you are uh, watching this, this presentation and please just close your eyes for a moment uh, and picture, if you will, uh, a healthy stream. Uh, you know, I think that, that for most people when they, when they perform this exercise, they think of some kind of, you know, the kind of stream you would see in, uh, in an Orvis catalog or, you know, or, or field and stream, kind of a, you know, a fast moving, free flowing, gravel or cobble bottomed, uh, you know, sort of straight as a string uh, stream, the kind, of, the kind of thing you could, you know, toss a, a dry fly in pretty, pretty happily. Uh, what, they, what they don't tend to picture, I don't think, uh, are, are these kinds of, of streams. You can, you can close your eyes now, sorry if I didn't mention that. Um, you know, I think that people don't tend to envision uh, a beaver modified uh, aquatic ecosystem, right? Of course, beaver beaver complexes are very different. Uh, they're sluggish. They're you know they're filled with with dead and dying uh, trees. They you know they smell kind of like decomposition. Uh, you know, it'd be a pretty challenging place to uh, to cast a fly, I think. Uh, but of course, you know these kinds of beaver modified ecosystems uh, were in many cases much more. Uh, rule than, than exception historically and, and in all kinds of critical ways they're they're healthier uh, or certainly equally healthy in their own way uh, and tremendously valuable both as wildlife habitat and uh, and as a as a provisioner of, of ecosystem services that uh, we humans rely on as well 
So that's what I'll be talking about today is, is using these incredible rodents uh, to, to, you know, to achieve various ecological goals uh, in the, the natural areas that you all manage. So although I'll although be talking uh, a lot about beaver as tool, as, as landscape modifier, uh, I think it's important to sort of establish a, a few you know, baseline beaver facts because these, these really are uh, incredible animals and, and uh, really remarkable feats of evolution in their own way. Uh, of course, beavers are rodents. They're semi-aquatic rodents. They spend really all of their lives uh, in and around water. Uh, they've got all kinds of fabulous adaptations uh, for this unique semi-aquatic niche they fill. They have extraordinarily dense fur, uh, as many individual hairs on a postage stamp size patch of skin as we have on our entire heads. Uh, they have these wonderful webbed duck-like hind feet uh, they can remain underwater for up to 15 minutes, so they're really quite, uh, quite fabulous swimmers. Uh, they've got a, a second set of eyelids, nictitating membranes, uh, which act as goggles. Uh, my favorite adaptation is they actually have a kind of a second set of lips uh, that, that close behind their front teeth like a valve so they can chew and drag branches underwater. I think that's really amazing. Uh, and then, of course, the most iconic beaver feature, the thing that makes a, a beaver recognizably a beaver, is this, this wonderful tail they have. Uh, the tail is the, the scales there are, are uh, keratin, the same stuff that's in your fingernails. Uh, and the tail is a, it's a, a kickstand when they're out on land, uh, a rudder underwater, uh, a fat storage device. So they've actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. Uh, and it's, a, of course, a, an alarm system. Uh, all of you guys have been, uh, you know, I'm sure you've been out on a stream or a pond uh, in the evening and, and heard the kind of explosive kerplunk of a, a beaver tail striking the water. And they, of course, they do that to warn other beavers uh, about the, the presence of predators. And the other fabulous beaver feature uh, is their, their teeth. Uh, you can see they've got these, these wonderful um, sort of chisel-like incisors that basically file each other down into these very sort of strong points. Uh, and the teeth are orange because uh, the teeth are actually sort of chemically and structurally fortified with iron uh, that beavers derive from their, their food. So their teeth are, are uh, remarkably durable and, and powerful. And of course, having, having durable teeth is important when you spend your whole life uh, cutting down trees, right? Beavers eat the cambium or the inner bark of trees. They're what scientists call choosy generalists. So they've got uh, a few species that they prefer. Willow, aspen, cottonwood in, in the American West. Those are kind of the big three. Uh, but they'll eat just, just about any uh, deciduous tree. And they also, they also um, you know, they browse on aquatic vegetation as well, you know, herbaceous stuff like, like water lilies and cattails. I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. Uh, so again, they're choosy generalists. And of course, they're, they're totally herbivorous, uh, as I'm sure you all probably know, but you never know who, who uh, has the misapprehension that, that uh, beavers eat fish. Beavers are completely herbivorous. So of course, in addition to uh, cutting down trees as their, their food source, they also use the wood as building material. Uh, and obviously beavers build dams, that's their, their most sort of famous uh, iconic behavior. What's the point of the dam? What is, what is the purpose of this really uh, sort of unique specialized behavior? Well, a beaver on land, as one biologist described it, it to me, is kind of a fat, slow, smelly package of meat, right? Beavers get eaten by cougars, wolves, coyotes, bears. Uh, so by building that dam and expanding that pool of water, they're basically increasing the extent of the aquatic habitat in which they're, they're safe. So the, the, so the dam is really there primarily as a, a way of, uh, of, of creating shelter. And beaver dams, you know, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, a typical beaver colony is in many cases building, you know, 10 to 15 dams. There's usually a big primary dam. Uh, and then a, a number of kind of smaller secondary dams. Beavers don't always, they don't have to build dams, right? If they live in a, you know, a large body of water like a, a lake or a river where there's sufficient water depth for them to feel safe, they're quite happy just, you know, burrowing into the bank uh, and not, not damming at all. But, you know, some of the dams uh, do get uh, pretty, pretty substantial. This is a dam in, uh, in Minnesota in Voyagers National Park uh, that I visited uh, that was, uh, you know, you can see it's about 15 feet high and, uh, you know, maybe seven or eight hundred feet long and is obviously the work of many generations of, of beavers all 
adding their, their stick to the pile. So these, these structures can be uh, quite, quite massive. And the other kind of important beaver function that I, I think we don't talk about enough is their, their canal excavation. You know, they're not just fantastic builders, they're also amazing diggers. And again, you know, the point of the canals, which can extend hundreds of feet back into the forest, uh, is basically, you know, they can swim up those canals without, without going onto land and exposing themselves to predation, and then, you know, cut an aspen tree uh, and float it back down the canal uh, to the, the, the main pond. So those, those canals, I think, are really important uh, in sort of ex expanding the extent of water and, uh, and kind of hydrating the, the forest in some ways. So today, uh, you know, nobody really knows how many beavers live in North America. You know, the best guess we have is maybe 10 to 15 million. So clearly uh, not an endangered species, uh, but you know, they exist at a, a tiny fraction really of their historic abundance. You know, again, we don't know how many beavers were here uh, before the arrival of Europeans in North America. Uh, but you know, the best guess we have is as many as 400 million beavers. You know, I think that certainly hundreds of millions is, is a, pretty, a pretty reasonable estimate. And you know, those hundreds of millions of beavers would have created hundreds of millions of beaver dams and, and impounded hundreds of millions of ponds. Uh, you know, again, the best estimate we have is, is that you know, there was something like, there was at least the capacity for uh, between 150 and 250 million beaver ponds in North America. Uh, prior to European arrival. And, uh, you know, of course, all of those beaver ponds would have impounded just an incredible extent of water. Uh, and, you know, a little back of the envelope uh, math tells you that, you know, perhaps 235,000 or so square miles of North America were impounded by beavers. That's, a, a, you know, an, an area the size of uh, Arizona and Nevada combined, basically. So, you know, the, the kind of the historic influence of this animal was really remarkable. And of course, you know, those, those beaver modified landscapes would have provided habitat for an incredible array of species and still do provide habitat for an incredible array of species. You know, beavers are uh, a keystone species, uh, a term that, you know, I assume that, that most of you probably know, uh, but basically in, in architecture, you know, the keystone is the top block uh, in a stone arch. And if you remove that block, you know, the, the entire arch crumbles. Uh, and beavers are, are playing kind of a similar role uh, in aquatic ecosystems. They're, they're disproportionately important. Uh, you know, we know that in the, in the American West, uh, you know, where many of you live, obviously, uh, and where I live in, in Spokane, Washington, you know, water is life. Uh, and, you know, any animal capable of storing and creating water uh, is, is enormously important. You know, wetlands cover 2% of our total land area in the West uh, and support 80% or so of the biodiversity. So a few beaver beneficiaries. Here's a, a great blue herring rookery uh, at a, a, a beaver complex in uh, Wisconsin that I visited. Uh, here's a, a moose hanging out very happily uh, around a beaver pond in, in Utah. You know, moose and, and beaver basically go, go uh, hand in hand or hoof and paw. Uh, you know, of course, waterfowl are, are tremendously dependent on, on beaver created habitats. Uh, amphibians, there are many, you know, many amphibians are, are virtually beaver pond obligates. Uh, and then, you know, passerines, songbirds, I think are, are not a beaver beneficiary that many people think about, but, you know, by cutting willow and basically inducing this kind of coppicing shrubby growth habit uh, in willow, you know, beavers are creating uh, really, really fantastic kind of nesting, perching, feeding substrate uh, for lots of passerines. And of course, beavers are also encouraging the, the production of aquatic insects. Uh, which is a really critical food source for, for lots of uh, birds, bats, you name it. Uh, here's one, one, I think, cool example of beaver habitat creation. This is a, uh, a beaver complex or a former beaver complex in, uh, in, in uh, Minnesota. You can see sort of over here, here's the old beaver dam, uh, which breached, uh, the pond drained, and kind of left behind this, this nice wet meadow uh, with the, the beaver lodge kind of stranded in the middle of it. And uh, in this case, a, a pack of wolves actually moved into this beaver lodge and uh, raised their pups in the lodge. So there's, there's beavers creating habitat for their direct competitor or direct predator rather, 
uh, I think that's that's really really incredible to me. And I, you know, I think that one important thing is that you know today uh, there's lots of lots of interest in in beaver based restoration, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But you know, I think what's crucial to remember is that that interest. The, the understanding that beavers are important is, you know, by no means a new realization. Uh, this is something that, you know, that the Native American tribes knew for, for thousands of years. Uh, as Rosalind Lapeer, the, the Blackfoot uh, historian and, and ethnographer, has noted, you know, beavers, I mean, the Blackfeet recognized that, you know, beavers created these incredible ecologically, e ecological oases uh, in these otherwise arid, you know, unproductive landscapes. Uh, and, you know, that was where uh, the, the Blackfeet harvested their firewood and, and, uh, and hunted game uh, and actually had cultural prohibitions against killing beavers, re revered the beaver uh, as this, this crucial habitat creator uh, in, a, in a kind of a, an arid American West landscape. So, you know, this, this notion that beavers are, are crucial to life uh, in the West, you know, by no means originated with with white scientists so you know a lot of what i tried to do in the course of writing my book was was to go back through old trappers records explorers journals native american histories uh railroad surveys trying to to piece together what a fully beavered north america would have looked like and and how it might have functioned and uh you know i think that you know there are some wonderful observations uh about the, the kind of the historic extent uh, of beaver landscape modification. You know, Meriwether Lewis, uh, of course, of Lewis and Clark fame, uh, was a, a really wonderful beaver observer, just a great naturalist in general. And, uh, you know, he pointed out that, uh, you know, that he and Clark saw beaver dams in basically every tributary of the, of the Missouri Basin in Montana, you know, as far as the eye could see uh, up to the, the base of the mountains. And in some cases, actually, the Corps of Discovery couldn't use those valley bottoms. They had to travel along the, the ridge lines or the main stem Missouri. Uh, because you know those tributaries were so thoroughly impounded by by beavers, I think that's that's pretty remarkable. So that was in you know in in, in, in 1805 that uh, that the Lewis and Clark saw beaver dams in every tributary as, as far as the eye could see. Uh, in 1843, just just 38 years later, John James Audubon, the, the famous naturalist and painter, traveled the exact same landscape. Uh, and couldn't find a, a single beaver. He was trying to paint beavers at that point, and there were no beavers to be had. So what became of those beavers? What did they turn into in just, in just 40 years or so? Well, of course, they became hats, right? Uh, you know, beaver, beaver fur, uh, beaver pelts, along with timber and cod were, you know, one of the most uh, important economic resources uh, that, that European fur trappers and traders found in the, the quote unquote new world. Uh, you know, the fur trade really begins in, in New England uh, in the early 1600s and kind of spreads south and then west, uh, basically wiping beavers out of every river, lake, pond, and stream that, uh, that, that fur trappers and traders uh, encounter. And it's, you know, it's really hard to overstate the extent to which this, this pursuit of pelts uh, drove early American history. Uh, you know, to use to use one example, uh, you know, it was, I mean, the, you know, beavers were really, uh, they played an integral role in the Revolutionary War, you know, it was, it was sort of the, the, the British denying colonists access to trapping grounds west of the Appalachian Mountains that helped incite uh, colonists to revolt. Uh, you know, the Louisiana Purchase was uh, was partly fueled by Jefferson's desire to secure new new trapping grounds. You know, it was it was beaver trappers and traders who spread smallpox and other diseases that that ravaged uh, Native American tribes. Uh, here's I think this is kind of a cool example. This is a a beaver coin minted in the uh, the former Oregon Territory in 1849, and the value of one beaver coin was worth one beaver pelt. So the, the whole economy uh, basically operated on the pelt standard. That's how integral beavers were uh, to, to 19th century uh, American economies. So in addition to being a, a hugely influential, important historical event, the fur trade was a dramatic ecological and even geological event, right? I mean, when you kill hundreds of millions of beavers and, you know, hundreds of millions of beaver dams break down and hundreds of millions of acres of beaver ponds uh, basically drain, right? You know, I, I don't think we think about uh, the fur trade 
in the same terms as we think about the deforestation of New England or gold mining in the Sierra Nevada or you know the busting of the Midwestern prairie as kind of this seminal ecological catastrophe. Uh, but you know there's no there's no question that it was. Uh, you know, in a, in a healthy beaver rich stream, you know, all of those beaver dams are acting as speed bumps essentially, right? Slowing water down, spreading it onto the floodplain connecting that, that stream or that river uh, with its floodplain and, and basically, you know, hydrating these, these wonderful wetlands and, and wet meadows. And when you lose all of those, those beaver built uh, speed bumps, you know, there's really nothing checking the velocity of water. And what you get in many cases is really dramatic and rapid incision. Uh, so, you know, streams like this one, these, you know, these deeply incised degraded streams that have lost their floodplain connectivity, uh, which of course, I'm sure you've all seen a stream like this one. Um, you know, this is in, in many ways an artifact of, uh, of beaver trapping among other, other forces. So what did it mean, you know, for the, the boreal toad, for example, uh, you know, a species that's basically a beaver pond obligate uh, to lose all of that habitat? Well, we'll never fully comprehend the, the magnitude of that loss, but there's no question it was, it was a, a, a devastating event. Uh, for, you know, boreal toads, moose, coho salmon, wood ducks, uh, you, you name it. So I think that's a, you know, a really important way of sort of realigning our understanding of, of history is just how dramatic and influential an event that the fur trade really was. So fortunately, by, by 1900 or so, we, you know, we've begun to, to wise up, you know, beavers were basically uh, extirpated from the, the lower 48. Uh, there were just, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, maybe 100,000 or so left in, in North America, most of them in, in Canada. Uh, but fortunately, uh, you know, fish and game agencies begin to kind of wise up, you know, Enos Mills, who was a, a, a kind of a mentee of John Muir's, posited that a live beaver was more valuable than a dead one. That was kind of a, you know, a heretical notion in some ways. Uh, but slowly, you know, beavers begin to be uh, reintroduced to their, their former haunts. Uh, and I'll just show you a, a quick uh, video clip of, of uh, probably the most famous beaver reintroduction, uh, which occurred in, uh, in Idaho in, uh, in 1948. Uh, you know, the state of Idaho basically was trying to introduced some beavers to, uh, to what is today the, the Frank Church wilderness area. And, uh, you know, it was, it was 1948. There were a lot of uh, surplus airplanes and, and parachutes on hand after uh, World War II. And uh, one of the, these state biologists had the bright idea of basically airdropping a, a few beavers into the, into the back country. Uh, so that, that year they, uh, they, they parachuted uh, 76 beavers into the Idaho backcountry, 75 of the beavers survived. One beaver, uh, unfortunately, escaped from his crate and uh, fell to his death, very sad. Uh, but the next year when they, they flew back over this same landscape, uh, they saw ponds and, and dams in every place that they dropped beavers. So at the time, this was actually uh, a pretty, pretty successful project. Nobody is uh, air, air lifting beavers today, but you know, in 1948, this was sort of state-of-the-art beaver reintroduction. <clears throat> so throughout the 20th century, you know, beavers are beginning to recover. They're, they're kind of returning to some of their, their former haunts. Uh, but, you know, of course they find that in their absence, we've colonized the, the landscape uh, pretty thoroughly, right? It turns out that good beaver habitat and good human habitat is one and the same. You know, we both love these low gradient stream bottoms, we you know fertile floodplains, that's where we, you know, build all of our infrastructure. And, uh, and that's where uh, beavers, of course, love to love to settle. Uh, so, you know, I would, I would argue that it's really we who are the, the nuisance species in, in some ways more than them. But, you know, there's no question that as, as beavers return to human dominated landscapes, conflicts can arise. Here's a, a set of railroad tracks in, in Massachusetts. Uh, that I visited a few years ago that uh, beavers had, had flooded pretty, pretty thoroughly, basically, you know, grinding service to a halt. Uh, I like this picture. This is a, a cabin in, uh, in New Mexico near Taos. And uh, what you can see here is that beavers kind of began, they, you know, they, be they began their dam over here in the top left corner of the screen, uh, kind of dammed up to the base of this cabin. Then they incorporated the cabin in the dam and then they continued on the other side. So I wouldn't want to be this, this landowner, but you have to kind of admire the, uh, the, the ingenuity there. 
Uh, another very common beaver conflict, of course, is damming in, in road culverts, which you know, raises the water level and, and uh, washes the road out. That's probably the most common beaver conflict uh, in, in North America. And uh, yeah, they do get into all kinds of more creative, uh, bizarre mischief. This is a, a beaver that broke into a, a dollar store in Maryland and was actually browsing the plastic Christmas tree rack uh, when, when he was apprehended by the authorities. So that, that feels like a, a metaphor for, for something. So they get into all kinds of uh, unusual trouble. Uh, and of course, the way those kinds of conflicts are, are generally handled uh, is by trapping out lethally the offending beaver. Uh, you know, the, the US government, the, you know, the Department of Agriculture uh, kills around 20,000 beavers every year. Uh, you know, private trappers, uh, private nuisance trappers, you know, kill certainly tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of beavers more. And, you know, there's obviously a, you know, a certain intuitive logic uh, to, to trapping uh, nuisance beavers. I mean, of course, uh, you know, you're getting the beaver out of there. But the issue is that, well, first you're, you know, you're potentially destroying uh, that, that pond and wetland habitat that beavers are creating. But you know, I think that from a you know a cost benefit standpoint, the bigger issue is that you're just putting up a, a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as the, you know, the kind of the the habitat is there, the beavers are going to return to that site. And you know, in so many communities have ended up in this very time-consuming, expensive cycle of trapping and recolonization and trapping and recolonization. So that you know suggests that maybe look, maybe there's a, a better a better way. Um, of handling some of some of these these beaver damage scenarios, uh, you know, here's kind of a nice example. I think in uh, in Colorado, this is a uh, at a reservoir I visited, um, where the the kind of the land trust who is managing this property, uh, you know, they wanted to protect the you know, they, they, they have these beautiful old cottonwoods uh, at this at this uh, this lake, and you know they wanted to protect those cottonwoods from the from the beavers, so they basically fenced them. Uh, you know, with some pretty low cost, low tech uh, wire fencing, and they left unfenced the, uh, the, the non-native Siberian elm trees. So the beavers actually felled the Siberian elms and then uh, left the cottonwoods alone. So that's, that's invasive species control using a beaver as your agent. I think that's, that's pretty cool. So I, I don't think that any beaver should ever be killed for cutting down a tree. That's just too easy a problem to solve uh, with a bit of a bit of wire. Uh, but you know, thousands of beavers are killed for, for exactly that. Uh, you know, beaver flooding is, is potentially, uh, you know, a more challenging problem to solve. But you know, there too, uh, we've got options. This is uh, a, what's called a flow device. This model is a, a beaver deceiver, uh, is what it's known as. And you know, basically, it's this pipe and fence system, you know, you run the pipe uh, through the road culvert, through the beaver dam, uh, and, you know, you're basically moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side. You know, you're basically creating a leak in that dam and, you know, draining, up, draining the pond to a level that's acceptable for both humans and, and beavers. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you have seen these things. Uh, you know, you often hear that, well, wait a second, you know, do, do, these, do these contraptions really work? Um, but, you know, there's, there's no doubt that a well-made flow device uh, is very effective in solving beaver conflicts. Uh, here's a little study in Massachusetts that basically found that, uh, you know, these, these sorts of devices were effective you know, anywhere from 87 to 97 percent of the time. So, you know, maybe not every single conflict can be solved with a flow device, but there's no question that we're, you know, we're killing uh, many, many thousands of beavers. Um, when we could be handling those conflicts non non lethally, another uh, sort of increasingly prevalent, promising sort of technique, beaver restoration technique, uh, is the the creation of, of beaver dam analogs, um, which are basically human built beaver dams. And you know, I, 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 I'm sure that many of you have heard of these. Uh, some of you have probably experimented with them a little bit uh, your, yourselves. And you know, basically, the idea here is that you know you're you're building a beaver dam in a site, you know, in many cases a, a degraded site um, that beavers might not be inclined to uh, to colonize on their own. You know, a place that historically had beavers, um, but you know now because perhaps because it's incised, uh, is no longer able to to support them. Uh, and you know, they're again very low tech. 
very uh, inexpensive restoration technique. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of broken fingers are kind of the one, uh, one, of the, one of the few hazards you have to watch out for here. Uh, you know, you can use a sledgehammer or kind of a hydraulic post pounder uh, to, to build these things. And you know, the place that, that beaver dam analogs you know, have been sort of most intensively studied and most, most uh, you know, clearly uh, proven their, their merits um, is, in, is in the Columbia Basin in, in that sort of central Oregon on a stream called, uh, called Bridge Creek. Uh, and there, you know, that was again, a kind of a degraded stream uh, that historically had beavers, but you know, beavers were having sort of a hard time uh, reestablishing there. So in that case, you know, researchers built a 115 uh, of these beaver dam analogs. And you know, the beavers, which again, had been present in the system, um, but had, had, had had a hard time, you know, building sort of stable functioning dams, uh, you know, basically used that, those structures as kind of like starter kits, you know, they're sort of like beaver recruitment tools. Uh, and you know, beavers built uh, 121 dams of their own. And uh, the result of that was a, a more than doubling of the inundated area, right, as, you know, as, as ponds form and water basically spreads out in the landscape. And you know, the upshot of that uh, was a 12-fold increase in side channels, right? So there are all of these historic side channels in kind of this, you know, this messy, complex stream that had become single thread. And when that, when that water got pushed onto the floodplain, you know, all of those, those side channels began to uh, rehydrate, essentially. And you know that's a that's a really big deal for these guys. This is a juvenile steelhead, uh, you know, which of course are that's a, a listed fish uh, in the in the Columbia Basin. And uh, what researchers basically observed here was that you know thanks to all of this beaver activity, uh, there was a 50% increase in in uh, juvenile steelhead survival, right? Because if you know if you're look if you're a, a, you know a baby steelhead uh, or you know any salmonid really, you don't want to live in you know this kind of free-flowing, fast-moving, uh, you know, fire hose-like channel. You want to live in, you know, in a, in a pool or a side channel or a backwater or an eddy, and that's exactly the kind of, of complex slow water refuge habitat that, that beavers create. Uh, you know, one common objection that uh, you do still hear from fish biologists sometimes is, well, you know, wait a second, uh, you know, dams are bad for fish, right? We're not, we don't want to put more structures in streams, uh, you know, to potentially impede uh, migratory fish. But of course, you know, beaver dams are nothing like uh, human-built dams. Uh, fish, you know, can kind of wriggle through them, go around them during high flows. Uh, I think this is kind of a, a cool, a cool picture. Uh, here you can see the, the the beaver dam in the bottom right. Uh, this is this is near Seattle. Uh, this picture was taken, um, and you know, and here are the kind of the two freshly dug coho salmon reds. Uh, so clearly a couple of fish had no problem uh, surmounting this, this beaver dam. And in fact, the evolutionary connection between beavers and salmon is so deep uh, that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump. So an another kind of technique at, a, at, our, at our disposal for handling beaver conflicts is relocation, right? And you know, this is not, it's not possible in every state, you know, of course, state laws uh, vary wildly when it comes to, uh, to beaver relocation. You know, it's very difficult in, uh, in California, whereas in, in Washington, where I live, um, you know, there are many projects that are able to move, move some beavers around. But, you know, depending on where you are, this is, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty wonderful option, I, I think. Um, you, know, you know, in most cases, right, you're trying to kind of capture and move uh, an entire beaver, beaver colony or family, um, you know, from the site where they're causing an issue to, you know, in most cases, uh, public lands, you know, generally far, far from people. Uh, you know, a lot of the beavers you catch are going to be two-year-old sort of juvenile dispersing beavers. Uh, in which case you might want to try to uh, pair them up, basically operate a little beaver tinder service, uh, as many projects do at, uh, you know, at, at fish hatcheries and other facilities. Uh, you know, the idea being that if you move one beaver on, on his or her own, you know, he's just going to move around and, and not stay where you put him and, you know, probably get eaten by a cougar wandering the landscape. Whereas, you know, by, by moving family units or these kind of compatible couples, uh, you know, they're more likely to kind of stay put and, uh, and, and settle down. Uh, you know, one thing that, that many projects are doing now, uh, which I, I kind of like is, you know, is, is building these kind of artificial beaver lodges, 
uh, that the animals can move into so they don't get eaten right away. Uh, you know, they're not going to use these long term, they're just going to use them until they can build a, a better structure of their, of their own. Uh, and here's a, uh, here's a, a beaver in, uh, in the Cascades in Washington uh, using, uh, using his, his new lodge. So, um, you know, beaver relocation is, uh, you know, the, of course, not all of them, not all, not all of them are going to survive. They're not all going to stay where you put them. Uh, but, you know, the success rates in, in some cases can be, you know, can be pretty, pretty reasonable. So, you know, I just wanted to sort of conclude by talking about a, a few of the the other ecosystem services or, or benefits that come with beavers. You know, I, I talked uh, a, a little bit about, uh, you know, their, their habitat creating prowess, but what do beavers do for, for us humans? Uh, that's, that's, so, that's so wonderful. And not that that's the, you know, sort of the sole measure uh, of an animal's worth, uh, but it is a kind of a helpful argument to be able to make on, on their behalf. Why do we care about these, these critters anyway? Well, you know, the, I mean, the biggest thing, of course, in the American West, uh, you know, in, in our dry, arid, drought-prone region is that they, they store a lot of water, right? And, and uh, you know, to me, the, my favorite case study um, to this effect is, is uh, occurred in Northeast Nevada um, on a kind of a, you know, in the, the Humboldt River watershed on a series of creeks, including Maggie Creek. This is BLM land. And, uh, you know, you can just see that this, I mean, this land has been totally degraded. Um, by, you know, a hundred years or so of, uh, of unmanaged cattle grazing. So, and, you know, in this, in this case, uh, you know, the BLM in partnership with the, the, the permittees, the, the ranchers here, uh, you know, basically implemented some pretty sort of common sense uh, prescriptions to, you know, to protect riparian areas. You know, they, they fenced some sections, they changed the grazing rotations, you know, nothing too, nothing too dramatic, but, you know, just enough to allow some riparian vegetation to recover. And although nobody was really thinking about beavers when they when they did this, uh, you know the beavers. I mean, beavers have this kind of magical way of finding their finding their way back into available habitat. So this picture that you're looking at, this was taken in 1980. The next picture I'm going to show you is is a picture that I took in more or less the exact same place in 2017, after you know maybe 25 years or so of managed grazing, uh, and maybe 15 to 20 years of beaver recolonization. So just keep this picture in your mind and then check out this. I think that's pretty cool, right? Um, you know, and, and you, you might look at, this, look at this and say, well, wait a second, you know, I don't see any beavers, but actually all of this, this cattail growth in the middle here is growth atop uh, a beaver dam. So they're really deeply embedded in this system at this, at this point. And so, you know, the researchers who studied this, this system basically found that beavers produced 20 acres of, of open water, uh, all of these wonderful, you know, ponds and wetlands that are so, there's such fantastic habitat. Um, three miles of wetted stream length. So the, so the stream was actually so degraded that it had been going dry before reaching its confluence uh, with the kind of the main stem Humboldt River. So by slowing that water down, beavers basically ensured there would still be water in the stream in you know August, September, October, uh, the hot the hot dry season. So beavers basically took this seasonal stream and made it perennial. I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, they also raised the water table by three feet, right? I mean, you know, you would look at a beaver pond and you see all of the all of the surface water, but what you don't see is the water being forced into the ground, recharging aquifers, raising that groundwater table and uh, basically irrigating this valley. You know, they, the, the researchers documented a hundred more acres of riparian veg, thanks to, thanks to beavers and this kind of this irrigation effect, the sub-irrigation effect that they create. And uh, you know, that's a big deal for this guy. This is James Rogers. He was one of the, the ranchers in Northeast Nevada who's really embraced beavers. And you know, the point that he made to me is that beavers were basically increasing grass production uh, on his ranch tenfold which means more weight on his cows and more more money in his back pocket. So, you know, now in Northeast Nevada, there's this kind of this wonderful uh, cluster of, of pro beaver ranchers who have experienced this, these kinds of irrigation benefits uh, from, from these, these amazing rodents. Uh, another kind of fabulous beaver service is, is this, you know, the pollution capture function, right? I mean, there, you know, you can see here's a, an old beaver dam in Colorado, you know, when that when that stream hits that dam, of course, you know the water slows down, and everything that that water column is carrying has a, has a chance to settle out, right? So beavers, you know, they're storing tremendous amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, 
heavy metals in, in systems uh, that you know, were historically degraded by mining. Uh, they're also sequestering huge amounts of carbon, right? And here's a, a study uh, basically showing that two beavers, two beavers and, you know, who built 13 dams, captured 100 tons of sediment, 15 tons of carbon, and a ton of nitrogen. So, that, so this kind of, you know, they're basically these landscape scale kidneys uh, filtering out, you know, whatever, whatever pollutants uh, are, are floating along in the water column. Uh, another kind of wonderful beaver benefit uh, that's that's you know really prevalent in, in certain places is is a kind of a flood control benefit, right? I mean, beavers, you know, by building dams, they're slowing water out, they're slowing water down, they're spreading it out, they're sinking it into the ground, uh, and they're basically capturing huge amounts of of stormwater. Uh, and this is this is a, a beaver a beaver complex that I visited in Scotland, uh, where Eurasian beavers have been reintroduced. Uh, and of course, Scotland's a very, you know, a very wet, rainy place, very flood prone. And uh, there, you know, this, this flood control benefit is the kind of the primary thing that, uh, that, that people are, are uh, embracing beavers for. So that's, that's kind of the, the magic of beavers is that they, they address both drought and its opposite, flooding, right? They take, they take these kind of wild swings in the hydrograph and basically smooth them out. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty incredible. And then the final, you know, fabulous beaver benefit that we're just we're just beginning to understand now, uh, and it's so prominent and important in the American West at the moment is their their ability to fight fires, right? I mean, here's a you know kind of a wonderful example uh, in Idaho. This is this is uh, Sharps Fire, and you can see that you know these these uh, these you know the flanks of these mountains have just been burnt to a crisp, and the only green, wet, blue, lush place on the landscape. Uh, is this this beaver hydrated valley bottom? So you know there there was just just last month a kind of a wonderful paper was published, basically proving that you know that beavers are creating these these kind of fantastic fire refugia, uh, where all kinds of critters can can retreat during the wildfire, uh, and then recolonize the landscape. And in some cases, beavers are even creating fire breaks, stopping stopping fire in its tracks. So that's again a you know a benefit that we're just we're just beginning to understand. Uh, but it is, you know, I think increasing, only increasing the rationale for restoring these animals. So to wrap it all up, you know, we have this, this kind of incredible, incredible creature that was, you know, hugely important and, and influential and prevalent on the landscape historically. Uh, it's beginning to recover. Uh, there are all kinds of, you know, kind of wonderful techniques from, you know, from coexistence strategies to beaver dam analogs to relocation. Uh, that, that are allowing beavers to, to recolonize our landscapes. Uh, they, pro they provide all of these wonderful services basically for free. Uh, and the best part is they don't need permits. I think that's really, that's really nice. So to sum it all up, it's time that we you know, get out of the way and uh, let the rodent do the work as the, the mantra of the beaver believer goes. So with that, I'll say uh, thank you guys so, so much. And I, I hope this uh, has given you some some uh, helpful uh, you know, rationale or, or, or advice about how to embrace these, these, these incredible animals uh, on the lands that you yourselves manage. So thank you guys. Ben, thank you so much. That was really, um, really a great talk and such an excellent summary of your book, which um, I can attest has a lot more great information and it's one of the best books I've read in a long time on natural history and the importance of this, this uh, animal as a restoration tool. So I just, I want everybody to know that we, we aren't going to take, do Q&A with Ben right now because Ben has graciously offered to host a steward circle tomorrow at two o'clock, 2 o'clock PM Eastern time, 11 o'clock um, Pacific time. So please join him to continue this fascinating conversation. Keep your questions until then. There have been a couple asked at this point, uh, but we will make sure we capture those for you, Ben, and you can maybe go into that session with those questions. So if you folks asked questions, uh, be sure to pop into Ben's steward circle tomorrow and we'll make sure we get you some answers. Okay, at this point, we're gonna go to break. And while you uh, certainly have time to uh, stretch and get some refreshments. You also have an hour to go to the exhibit hall to meet with our poster presenters. All of the poster presenters will be live in their booths from 1255 
Eastern time until 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's 10 cent Pacific to 11 Pacific. Uh, and they are eager to talk with you about their projects. So please take some time to speak with them, ask them about their research and uh, yeah, give them some attention. There's some great research being presented at the poster session. Formats similar to when posters are displayed during a reception, guests are free to move around through the posters and converse with presenters at their own pace. Enjoy the exhibit hall and we'll see you later today for the Quaking Aspen Challenge Symposium. So, all right, thanks everybody.